Okay, so we are moving on to ruminant and swine, since we're still on the topic of large animal. Um, but there are some very unique differences here. I'm going to focus more on the ruminant, which is, well, it's really cows, goats, and sheep, but I'm focusing mostly on the cow um, when we talk about this. But the first thing to understand is I can have a cow that's like 1,800 pounds and a horse that's 1,800 pounds, but there's going to be some key differences. Even though size is always going to be a challenge when I'm talking about these species, there is a big difference because one thing to consider is the obviously the GI tract is a completely different physiology because a horse is a hindgut fermenter and a cow is a foregut fermenter, meaning they have the ruminant stomach and that's going to present some challenges. But the key thing here is that ruminants or cattle are not going to go under anesthesia or extensive surgery. Like when I talk about in an OR, when we put a horse on the table, drape them, put them on a ventilator, it's very rare that we're gonna do that on a cow for a couple of different reasons. But the biggest being is economics. <clears throat> Cattle are food animals and they are production animals. And you know we're trained to think of our pets and what we would do for our pets. And is that okay? But a farmer is not going to look, not that they don't love their cows, but they're not going to look at them in the same way we're going to look at a dog or a cat or a horse. Because if they spend a lot of money on one cow, that affects the money making for the rest of the cows. It affects the money on the farm. So it has to be pretty special of a cow or a special situation where a cow would go under general anesthesia. So I'm gonna tell you right off the bat, when we do cattle, a lot of it is done with standing chemical restraint and local blocks. For example, a C-section, a cow is standing. They are gonna do that with heavy sedation, the standing chemical restraint, and with a local block, the inverted L. So they're not gonna drop or put that cow on a table. So first of all, Economically, it doesn't make sense. And that goes for swine as well. You know, pigs are for production, okay? They're not gonna put a lot of money into one pig when they have to take care of the whole herd. Um, the other thing is temperament because now cattle are generally a lot more calm than horses. They are not flight animals. They are not reactive like a horse is. Now, I will tell you in school, when I was at Purdue, I actually milked cows on the weekend that were hospitalized for extra money. I was like, I had every loan known to man, and I was trying to get money. And when, we, when I think of cattle, we have what are called beef cattle and dairy cattle. Obviously, dairy, they are used to being milked every day. They're used mostly for their milk. And then you've got beef cattle that are primarily raised just for their beef and they aren't handled as often. So I'm not saying every cow is gonna be calm. In general, they are more calm than a horse. But I'm gonna tell you, beef cows are much harder to handle than dairy cows because dairy cows come in the milking barn twice a day. They're corralled, they're used to being led, they're used to being in restraints, they're used to being, you, know, you put a milking machine on them. So they're very, used to this routine. So I will say there was a couple times where I had to milk beef cows because they were hospitalized. And, but in general, it's not, I would always like, please be at a Holstein, please be a Jersey cow because, you know, they generally have a better temperament. But overall, cattle are more calm. And if they're more calm, they tend to do better with standing chemical restraint and they tend to do better with local blocks. So most of the time, procedures will be standing procedures. Um, they do get a lot of issues, I will say, with their hooves, with their eyes, lacerations from the pasture and fencing. So, you know, sometimes need C-sections and advanced obstetric procedures. They tend to get abscesses. Okay, you know, these are the deal, you know, dehorning, so these are the kind of the procedures that we typically see in cattle where they would need sedation or 
anesthesia. Um, one key, and this goes for cows and pigs, because they are meat producing animals, whatever drug that you give them, and I know you've done this in pharmacology, there are withdrawal times. So if you give a shot in the muscle, we know it's gonna take umpteen days or whatever for that drug to be completely out of the system. So whatever day that cow has surgery, that cow cannot be sent to slaughter for so many days because the product is still um, in the meat. Same for the milk. If you're gonna give them you know, a Holstein, who, you know, Holsteins are the black and white cows that you see kind of in the pasture. If you're going to be milking them and they've had drugs, then normally you still have to milk them because they would fill up and that would be painful. So normally those cows, they would milk them and dump the milk. So we're not gonna, t we're not, gonna not milk them, but we just can't give that milk to market. It has to be dumped. Um, so again, economic concerns, temperament concerns, you have to think about withdrawal time. Those are three key things that I mentioned. Now, it also is challenging because of their size. We typically use special equipment. Um, there is something called tilt tables. And I don't know if you talked about that in large animal, um, head gates. So normally when cattle are brought into the hospital, like at Purdue, we had a cattle room and it was a series of like gates the truck would back out and let the cow out of the truck, but it would go right into a gate and it would follow a maze and then they put their head in and it closes. And if you've ever watched, you know, normally, like I said, I'm not a Dr. Pole fan, but you'll see sometimes when he's out doing cows, they all go in these head shoots or a head gate and it keeps their head still. Um, so normally you're going to do them in some type of a gate, some type of a hoist and a tilt table. Um, these are kind of interesting, and I'll try to play a video here at the end, but part of the wall is actually a table. So when the cow walks up, they're against a wall. There's straps that go around their neck and around their belly, and then the wall actually tips up and becomes a table. So now we can access their hooves. We can access their belly. Um, and you can actually, if you have to trim their hooves, you can do that with them awake. But a lot of times we'll give them a little sedative and then we'll put them on this table and flip them up. Now, if they're going to be on a, if they're going to be on like in a surgery, like for like a colic or something, they would be hoisted similar to a horse and put on a table. Again, there are small ruminants. Calves is a baby cow. You, goats are small. Sheep are small. If it's under 300 pounds, the same principle applies. You can use a small animal anesthesia machine, small animal tubes, small animal bags, um, but it's over 300 pounds, then you need to use large animal equipment, large animal bags. So what is some unique physiology? Well, first off is that ruminants in general produce a lot of saliva. It's part of how when they eat the grains and the hay, and a lot of saliva needs to mix with that grain to start breaking it down, and then they swallow that saliva. So they're gonna produce more saliva, but the problem is if I'm gonna anesthetize them, and they're gonna potentially lose reflexes, all of that saliva that's in the back of their throat can be aspirated. And we worry aspiration is when something fluid-like or solid is sucked into the lungs. The only thing that should be in the lungs is oxygen. So we don't want them aspirating saliva. The other thing that they are prone to is regurgitation. So the difference is there's regurgitation and there's vomiting. Regurgitation is like the burp and it brings up some stomach fluid. That is not active. Vomiting is active. Vomiting is when they, and they actually, their stomach propels. The problem is when you lay a cow on its side, and if you give them any sedative, okay, they have all that fluid in their rumen. That stomach fluid 
can potentially, the esophagus is gonna relax, it's gonna allow that fluid to come up in the mouth. So we worry about cattle regurgitating, potentially saliva, well, regurgitating stomach contents. And if they aspirate stomach contents, that can be very damaging to the lungs. They are also very prone to bloat. Now, if you're trained like me, when you hear the word bloat, you think GDV in dogs. And GDV is where the stomach twists and then it fills up with gas and bloats. Cows are prone to bloating because what happens is when they're relaxed or they're on their side, in what happens is the rumen is still producing gas, but it gets trapped. If they can't burp, and if they cannot pass gas or fart, then what happens is that gas is gonna stay there and swell. And you're gonna see this on their left side because the rumen occupies the left side of the abdomen, and that's what we're worried about. So literally, I could stand behind a cow, and they should be the same width on both sides. If I see the left side, here I'll do it like this, if the left side is really big and the right side is like this, it can be that that rumen is bloating. Okay, so one thing that we do, and hopefully you've learned this in large animal, we're always assessing cows and horses <coughs> for gut sounds. They talk about listening in four quadrants because you wanna listen cranial dorsal, cranial caudal, ventral dorsal, ventral caudal, you're gonna listen and you should hear gurgling and erping and basically if you've ever eaten a crazy meal and all of a sudden you're sitting there and you hear your stomach or you feel, you know, that's your gut sounds because your gut is working on a meal. This can happen, but definitely gut sounds are good. It means they have motility. Anesthesia automatically slows down motility. They are anesthetized or sedated. So I don't expect them to have their full normal motility, but they need to have some motility. It could be slower, but we have to really watch for it because if they have no motility, they are gonna bloat. If they can move stuff through modal, then they're gonna get rid of that gas and hopefully do not bloat. Now, getting them ready, it's, we're going to do a physical, we're going to weigh them, and we're going to want to fast them. So you want to put a note on this slide number four. Fasting is always up to the doctor. Everybody kind of has their theories. In general, these guys are fasted usually for 24 hours. Because, and it's a longer time because they do have, remember, the rumen is holding on to a couple days worth of meals. So it's not like they do not have any food in their stomach, but because food tends to stay in the rumen, we can withhold their food longer, and it's gonna force that stuff through the rumen. So you wanna fast them because that's gonna help with bloat, to help prevent bloating. They're gonna have a jugular catheter, fluids, check your oxygen flow, make sure all your tubes are set out, test the anesthesia machine, and these guys will be on a ventilator too. So it's the same theory as a horse as far as ventilation because they are so big. And when you turn them over, if you put them on their side or their back, it's gonna put weight on the diaphragm and they are respiratory depressed. So they need to be on, if they are gonna be under general gas anesthesia, they need to be on a ventilator. This is another species where we take over CPPV. Now, if it's a goat or a sheep or a calf, they're smaller. You may just intermittently bag them or you may allow them to breathe, but they're not nearly as big as an adult cow. So if it's an adult, um, they really need to go on a ventilator. Obviously, we're going to do the same. Check our database, come up with a physical status, decide if we need blood work. Are we an excellent, good, fair, poor, critical? And also, what is what procedure are we doing? Is it just a cut to the eyelid? Or are we doing a C-section? Those are very different procedures. So when I'm looking at drugs, I might just need a light sedation, or I mean I might need long, heavy sedation, 
due to how long the procedure is. So that all has to factor in. Okay, I've tried to stress this in every lecture, but what you wanna do is make sure you have everything set up before you actually give the induction agent. The induction agent is the drug that takes them from consciousness to unconsciousness. You don't want to anesthetize them and then, I don't have tubes, I don't have a monitor, I didn't check my oxygen. All of that should be checked because when you give the drug, time is of the essence. So you wanna make sure that your circle rebreathing system is ready, ventilator is good. Um, again, a cow, an adult cow is not gonna need a heating pad. But if you're working with this, like a goat, a sheep, you're working with you know a little calf, then you probably wanna have warm towels, warm fluids, heating pad to keep them warm. And then as always, where are your emergency drugs? Most practices that you will deal with, um, again, we always printed an emergency sheet for every patient that pre-calculated the emergency drug. So if you have an emergency, I'm not there like, oh God, my calculator and oh, I'm freaking out. I'm gonna have the drugs, doctor's gonna say give this, this, I'm drawing it up. So always have that ready. Now, sedation. A lot of times, remember I said in a horse, you always wanna pre-med them before you put the catheter in. You don't usually want to put an IV catheter in the horse if they're awake because of their temperament. In a cow, we can generally get the catheter in without pre-medding them. So if they're tractable, which is handleable, if they are calm, you can put it in. Now, if it's a beef cow, and I did one morning, back to my story briefly, the one morning I was milking cows and I go up to the stall, oops, I go up to a stall and there's all these signs, caution, 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 caution. And I walk up to the stall and it's a beef cow and she turns around and she's got a little calf with her but it wasn't nursing. And she gave me the dirtiest evil look. And I'm like, you know what? I don't have a ton of cow experience, but I know that she's pissed and I know that she doesn't want me in there. So, you know, there's definitely going to be cows that are, I'm not saying they're all going to just say, put a catheter in my neck, hold me, you know, that you do get resistance, but they're not nearly as flighty. So if they're aggressive or excited, yes, you may need to give them a tranquilizer or a sedative. The other thing, there's two, there's a, you know, one thing I want to mention here is anticholinergics, which is atropine and glycopyrrolate, are not used routinely for a couple of reasons. Number one, and you have to think about this, atropine will dry up secretions. The reason sometimes we give them as a pre-med is if we want to prevent excess saliva. So if you give atropine, hopefully they don't salivate as much. Or you give glyco glycopyrrolate as a better drying agent. It's just more expensive. So a lot of people use atropine because it's cheap. Um, but if I have an animal that already has a lot of saliva present, and then I give atropine, it's going to dry up or thicken what is there. And I will tell you, if I have an animal that has excess saliva, and they start having trouble breathing or they're coughing and they have all this saliva, I have to be able to suction their throat. So sometimes like when I did bulldogs, I always had suction available because bulldogs tend to have a lot of saliva. Well, my boss, my anesthesiologist, he did not like to use anticholinergics routinely in brachycephalics because he said, I'd rather them have excess saliva and have it be really watery so I can suction it, but he goes, if I give them atropine and I make those secretions very thick, it's gonna be hard to suction them. So that's the theory in the cow, is one reason why we do not routinely give atropine. The other reason is it can affect GI motility. When you have a hindgut fermenter, remember I said GI motility is important. You wanna be careful <clears throat> that we don't slow it down. Again, 
if it's an emergency, you need to use it, use it. Now I'm gonna type a note here and hopefully you guys can see this on the video. So I basically typed is cows are very sensitive to xylazine, which is an alpha-2 agonist. They're, they're sensitive to alpha-2s in general, but particularly xylazine. So they are saying you give a cow a tenth of a dose that you would give a horse. Well, let me give you an example. If I have five mils of a drug, okay, 50% of that is two and a half mils, okay? A tenth is going to be 0 0.5 mils. Because if I multiply 0 0.5 times 10, that gives me 5.0. So what they're telling you is that a horse could get 5 mils. A cow might get 0 0.5 mls. Do you see how much lower? So I could have a horse that's 1,800 pounds, and I can have a cow that's 1,800 pounds. The horse is going to get more, much, much more xylazine than a cow would. So if I ask you what drug is the cow sensitive to, it is xylazine. They are more sensitive to xylazine than other drugs. So we got to be very careful. So, and you can give them, we can use opioids so they're not sensitive like horses are to morphine. So you can give them a pre-med of like butorphanol or morphine. Um, so that's nice that you can use that in cattle. For IV induction, it has to be in a padded. All IV inductions are in a padded area that either has a tilt table or some type of transporter because again, you're not moving that cow once it's down. So whatever you need to do to that cow, you need to induce anesthesia near your equipment. You want to get them very quickly unconscious. So again, they are a bolus technique and you want to try to get them intubated as soon as possible so they don't aspirate. So get them unconscious rapidly, rapid induction, and get a tube in if you're going to tube as soon as possible. So a couple different drugs that we can use. Um, now in cows, they use something called double drip, which is ketamine and guafenicin to effect. So how you would give that is you bolus the ketamine, you push all the ketamine, and then you would start to give the guafinus until they relax. Now, in a large ruminant, you wanna do the bolus technique. If you have a calf or a goat or a sheep, you could probably use propofol, you could use double drip, but you could give the ketamine slowly, then the guafinus, but if you have an adult, the big thing is, and I, Hopefully you guys are listening to me. The reason we do bolus techniques in large animal is because they are very large and if they go through an excitement phase, they can injure you or themselves. So we wanna get them asleep very quickly. That's why we don't do titrate or give to effect techniques. But again, if it's a calf or a goat, someone can hold that goat, someone can hold the calf and make sure. now. In certain cases, you can use triple drip, but the thing that double drip is missing is xylazine. And xylazine, they're extremely sensitive to. So a lot of times you can get away with just these two agents and maybe a pre-med. You don't always need the xylazine as part of your protocol. Now, what's different is, let me talk about induction, and intubation and what makes it different from a horse. Okay, so let me talk about the difference with intubation. When you drop the cow, when they are anesthetized, especially if it's an adult, you really need to keep them in sternal. If you watch the horse video, they have the horse fall straight down and then roll over because a horse, you intubate in lateral. A cow really needs to be in sternal. So when you 
you'll usually put the, the cow behind a wall, make sure it falls straight down, and then usually people are going to have to help hold it. And be very cautious when you intubate to make sure they are not regurgitating. And remember, right after induction, the first thing somebody needs to do is somebody needs to verify heart rate. So again, they have a facial artery, the mandibular artery here. They have a transverse facial artery here. So if you can't put your hand on their chest to feel their heart or get a stethoscope, feel an artery, find a pulse somewhere that you can assess. And then we're gonna intubate. So when we talk about sizes, okay, it's gonna be similar to horse tubes. We're gonna do like the 22, 24, 26, up to 30. Um, now, if you're gonna do a calf or a goat, they are gonna need a stylet, um, cause you're gonna need, so that's similar to the cat. And a mouth gag or no one is gonna be holding a cow's head up like this. So I'm gonna tell you, they're very heavy. So you're gonna need some type of mouth gag that you can crank the mouth open and they don't open wide, okay? Um, if you have the little guys, like a calf, you can use a laryngoscope. In a big cow, it's gonna be a blind by feel. Now a horse is blind and you just put it in. You don't look, you don't feel, you don't do anything. When you do a cow, you're gonna actually have to feel back there and I'll explain. So you're gonna want a big syringe for the cuff or a small syringe if it's a you know calf. You're gonna do the little syringe, the adult, the big syringe. And then what's helpful is to maybe have suction because again, sometimes you go to open their mouth and there's all of this saliva and you don't wanna drag a tube through all that saliva. So a lot of times we'll have suction and I'll, you can crank the mouth open and then you can suck all the saliva up and then you can intubate. The forceps, what you can do with long forceps is they make these things called sponge forceps and they're long and you can clamp gauze. So sometimes I'll, if you don't have suction, you can take forceps with gauze and wipe out all of that saliva. But you wanna make sure there's no saliva that are back there. Now. If it's, let me explain, if it's a small ruminant like a goat or a sheep or a calf, they have a very thick tongue, their mouth does not open wide. So between a really big tongue and the fact that their mouth isn't open, it's very hard. So what you're gonna use is you're gonna wanna use a stylet, but it's different than how we use it in a cat. So actually, let me show you the pictures and this is easier. So here's a calf. Now a calf, someone could probably hold it up you are taking a laryngoscope and you're looking back there, but do you see how the stylet is past the tube? Here's the end of the tube. That's all stylet. Now I told you in a calf, the stylet, or a cat, the stylet should never come past the end of the tube. Now, the end of this stylet is blunt, it's smooth, it's not sharp, but you still have to be careful. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna look back there and you're gonna put the stylet over the epiglottis in the larynx. So when the larynx opens, you're gonna put the stylet. Then in this third picture, you can see they're threading the tube over the stylet, okay? So they're very difficult to just put a tube directly in. So the stylet, like I said, it's like when you put a needle in with your catheter, you get blood, you slide the catheter off the needle. So it's a similar theory is that the stylet goes in then you slip the endotracheal tube in. Now in an adult cow, um, this is blind, but it is by feel, okay? So what we're gonna do, it's easier if I show you the picture, and you. So normally someone ties the head up. Again, this is gonna be too heavy for someone to be sitting there like, okay, any day now. So what we'll usually do is have a rope tie, someone tie up their head, you put in the mouth gag, open their mouth, and then what you're gonna do, someone will pull that tongue for you. I would take this hand, because I'm right-handed, I take my left hand and I reach back there and I feel for the epiglottis. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna slide my endotracheal tube under my hand. So what's gonna do is this is gonna be your guide. Reach in that mouth, imagine me going inside that mouth, putting my tube under, because right now, 
I can't see the epiglottis. I can't see the trachea. It's way too deep back there. Their tongue is way too big. So again, feel, it's done by feel. So if I go back, you're gonna use a non-dominant hand, palpate the larynx, and then you're gonna direct the tube in, and then you're gonna go ahead and inflate your cuff and remove the mouth gag. Usually we put something in between their teeth so they don't chomp the tube, like a little piece of pipe or wood to keep their mouth open. Okay, now that you have them intubated, you're gonna go on to the gas and how we maintain them in the small guys is very similar to small animal. We put them on the isoflurane or the sevoflurane. Um, they're on oxygen. We're going to start our monitor. Adult cattle, like I said, you are going to want to have them on a ventilator. Okay, so I just talked about intubation and um, if we're going to maintain with an inhalant, again, a calf, a goat would be very similar to intermittently give them a breath, um, just like you would bag every three, five, ten minutes, depending on their CO2 level. Um, but adult cattle are going to be very prone to atelectasis, just like a horse. So they need to be, if they are anesthetized on a table, on oxygen and gas anesthesia, they need to be on a ventilator where you do the controlled positive pressure ventilation um, because they're going to hypoventilate. And remember, when you see hypoventilation, they're not breathing as often or they're not breathing as deep. The way you treat that is you breathe for them and you give them more breaths and you give them deeper breaths. So it says place on a ventilator if necessary, but if it's going to be anything over half an hour or so, they really need to just be put on a ventilator just like a horse. Now, if you're gonna do intravenous or TIVA, where they are completely unconscious, but just using IV agents, this would be for procedures that are maybe less than 20 minutes. Um, now, again, in cattle, we tend to use the double drip, which is just, they don't give the xylazine. Triple drip, remember, is ketamine, xylazine, guafenicin. Double drip would be ketamine guafenicin with no xylazine. So that's the difference. And again, because cattle are so sensitive to xylazine, they usually omit that. And because they're not as nervous or, you know, a little bit easier to handle, we don't need usually as deep of agents. Positioning them is going to be very similar um, to it says small animal, but also horses, okay? You want to have them padded because they are because they are weighted so heavy. The same thing I talked about in horses, the tying up and the neuropathies, you know, if they have a halter on, it needs to be padded. All of the surfaces don't hyperextend the limbs. Um, but another concern in cattle is that you want the mouth tipped lower than their pharynx, which is the back of their throat. Now, if you think about this, that's gonna help drainage because if you tip their head up, you can trap some of that regurgitated fluid. So if you put their head or the tip of their nose lower than their throat, hopefully you can help. You may have to periodically during the procedure suction out their airway and suction out or swab out any regurgitated fluid or excess saliva. Um, now, here's an example of that tilt table. So if you can imagine, uh, this is a Hereford, this is a beef cow, and this table was flat against the wall. It's been, what they did is they walked up the cow, okay, put the straps around it, then the table turns and puts it flat. So now they can do something to the head. Often, now cows need a lot of hoof care. They need hoof trimming. I mean, you can see right here, they have a biclavin hoof. You know, a horse has a solid hoof. A cow comes into a biclavin. Sometimes in the middle, they get trapped wires. They get lacerations. They tend to get stuff in their hooves. So they do need a lot of trimming, cleaning. They are prone to hoof abscesses. So, you know, using a tilt table like this, they make ones that you can take out to the farm. And then usually the hospital 
will have a tilt table in one of their um, ORs. And you can see right here that they do have this leg secure, but they have a wrap that's got some padding. So that chain is not laying directly on a nerve because we wouldn't want to have neuropathy. And again, if they're tilted on this table, you want to watch for bloating and you want to watch for pressure on any nerves or limbs. Now, the nice thing about recovering cows, it's very different. Um, they tend to wake up very chill. They're not like a horse and they don't want to stand right away. We tend to have the opposite problem. The problem we have in cows is they don't want to stand up. And if they are laying in a stall for too long in recovery, they can have a leg trapped underneath them and they can get pressure. They can get myopathy, neuropathy. So when they're in a stall, we want it to be padded either with padding or a lot of hay. And you want to try to get them in sternal. We don't want them laying on their side. First of all, if they're on their side, they're more likely to bloat. Second of all, if they're on their side, they're going to be more prone to pressure on that side. So sternal is going to be better with their head low. And then you're going to watch their abdomen. If you start to see the abdomen expanding, then something is blocked. They can't burp or they can't pass gas, and that buildup is gonna happen. You're usually gonna see it on the left side, because again, that's where the rumen is. Um, now, normally, when you extubate, I always tell you, you deflate the cuff in a dog or a cat, because you don't wanna have that cuff inflated and pull out and irritate the trachea. But when we have cattle, what you're gonna do is you're gonna leave a little bit of air in the cuff because what the theory is is when you pull that cuff out if there's any aspiration that made it into the trachea or saliva the cuff will pull some of it out i do that sometimes in small animal if i have a dog that had a lot of saliva or if i had a dog that had regurgitation or they have blood in their throat anytime they have fluid back there sometimes i leave a little air in the cuff because that will pull some of that material out again partially inflated I don't leave it fully inflated and pull it. I take out a little air. And again, you want to see a lot of swallowing and coughing before you pull that tube. So you want to make sure, because especially if they've got fluid back there, they have to be able to swallow and they have to be able to cough before you pull that airway or they're going to be prone to aspiration. So a lot of swallowing. Um, now make sure you remove enough air to remove the tube. There should, let me make this point for any animal. There should never be enough air in your cuff where you cannot pull a tube. If you untie your tube and you go to pull the tube and you can't get it out, you've put too much air in the cuff. Air in the cuff is never to secure the tube in place. It's just enough pressure to not allow gases to escape and to not allow aspiration of fluids okay um we don't walk away until they can hold themselves up so if you have a cow in sternal and people leave and again there's going to be a few of you in there because not one person is going to hold up a cow unless you're she-ra but if you let go and the cow starts to roll and they can keep themselves up then you can leave and the good thing with cattle, as soon as they are up, they can eat and drink. So not like horses where we usually wait about three hours before we feed them. They can have access to food and water immediately. That's, and let me say, that's always a doctor decision, but just in general, they generally can eat after they've had surgery. So here's an example. This cow, you can see the tube is still in the mouth. Somebody is sitting behind it, probably putting their feet you can see the knees right there are holding the cow sternal. So right now, they've got the halter on, they've got the IV catheter, um, the back legs are out, but the front legs are underneath, and they're going to wait to pull that tube till there is a lot of chewing and swallowing. And you can see the head is lower. Okay, so we never want to position the head up like propped up, because again, that can any of that saliva can get back in the trachea. So you want to be careful. Um, as far as ruminant recovery, um, 
once they're sternal and once you are pretty convinced they're not going to bloat or they're not bloating, um, usually they'll be quiet and usually they won't even try to stand until you stimulate them. You may have to go back in them and push them and kind of say, come on, come on, and shake them a little bit to get them up. I mean, I've seen people, it looks brutal, but they're in there like smacking them hard. I mean, they're, they can be really stubborn. But eventually, they got to get standing up. They cannot be on their legs for too long, okay? And again, here's a note. Do not withhold their food unless the veterinarian tells you to. Okay, I'm going to pause this video. I'll convert this, and then I'll start with the next slide, which is camelids, and then we go into swine. I'll only talk a little bit about camelids which are actually your llamas and your alpacas. And I only bring that up because they're getting kind of popular. So I'll pause here and I'll get the next one started.